This evening we continue our discussion on the subject of value, and perhaps at this stage of our subject we come the closest to the direct problems of Western psychology as this bears upon the theme or idea of value. Therefore, we begin perhaps by suggesting what is valuable. In Western life, value has nearly always been associated with objects. Things are valuable. Those who have many things are rich. And wealth implies a kind of value. To own or possess valuable things means to us to possess things which have market price. And in our effort to determine the wisest expenditure of our means, we seek to become skillful in determining the relative value of similar objects. In practical thinking, therefore, we believe in the intrinsic value of objects. Something is worth five dollars because of its shape or its size or the materials of which it is composed. It has what might be termed a fair trade price. But today most people buy wholesale. Therefore, the first problem that we come against is this idea of trying to secure something for less than its ordinary value. We are therefore bargain hunters. And gradually we learn what the Chinese learned 25 centuries ago, namely that most bargains are worth no more than we pay for them. Zen will go further than this and say that no matter what we pay for anything, it is too much. That factually there is no essential value in objects. And instead of building our consciousness upon the pricelessness of a thing, our only practical hope is that we can discover the usefulness of that thing. We are therefore paying for some usefulness, which means by extension that we are paying for some service which this thing confers upon us, or some benefit to ourselves. The real value, therefore, lies not in the object, but in ourselves. And the object is only important to the degree that in some way it contributes to our own natures. The Zen takes the attitude that everything that we can possibly possess own or secure in the material world is in a gradual but inevitable state of decay. Everything that we now consider valuable will sometime perish. And consequently, uh, it has no permanent endurance. In our way of life today, the rapidity of the perishing of things has been greatly exhilarated. Things are largely made today for the purpose of disintegrating in the very near future. Instead of the natural wear and tear, therefore, artificial termination is built into these things, so that in a short time we are faced with replacement. We buy something which is worth so much when we buy it. We take it out of the store and walk to the curb with it. In this little walk of a hundred feet, already half of the value is gone. Now what happened to it? 
it sort of evaporated. We were in the presence of a magical procedure. We also realize that for the most part, this process of disintegration is not marked by any obvious deterioration of the object. The automobile uh, that we drive out of the place where we have bought it loses considerable value by merely being driven to the house. And we may also point out that if we pay $5,000 for a car, somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,000 disappears on the first trip home. <laughs> Why? Because in the very process of driving it home, the car has ceased to be new. Now in this loss of its own newness, we have a marked loss of value. On the other hand, if we are able to endure this loss of value long enough, we'll say we are able to carefully preserve this car through its period of gradual decline until perhaps we have kept it for 50 years. Then it suddenly begins to increase in value again. It no longer runs, but it is becoming priceless for no reason that anyone can discover. And it's quite certain that if you keep this car long enough, you will get more for it than you paid for it. Or your descendants will. Because very few people will maintain the car for that length of time. Therefore, it becomes a rare thing. And scarceness, again, increases value. This peculiar situation certainly has nothing to do with the materials used in the construction of the car. Consequently, we are in the midst of what the Zen would refer to as a complicated process of illusion. Where do all these value factors develop? What do they actually mean? Actually, they do not mean anything. But they become important through common acceptance. A thing becomes valuable not because it is better or worse, but because it is scarcer, or perhaps it loses value because it is an unusual abundance. Scarcity, therefore, constitutes a kind of unbalance in the law of supply and demand. Where the demand is greater than the supply, things become more valuable. Where the supply is greatly in excess of the demand, we have a bargain sale. So actually, when we try to determine value, we are quite right when we assume with the Zen that we are dealing with something that has no real existence. Now, there are certain exceptions to this rule, but these exceptions are merely compromises with the essential principle. But in order to try to understand, we must follow the Zen thinking a little bit into what might be termed what kind of value an object has if this object has no value of itself. It must be worth something, some way. If it is totally and completely worthless in all ways, then it is neither desirable nor valuable. Zen says, for example, that one of the important values relating to things is our own attitude in the management of things. That which has no meaning of itself can become extremely meaningful when it is involved in the life of a human being possessing consciousness, thought, and emotion. This consciousness and this thought emotion pattern is exercised by things. The sensory perceptions lock upon things. Things are important 
to the degree that we can touch them and hear them and see them or taste them, they become important as they are objects having existence. Some things gain greatly in importance when they become ours because we want them. Others lose importance to us because they have left us, either through necessity or because we have discarded them. Zen, therefore, takes the ground that all things become responsibilities and that the concept of thing itself becomes the primary responsibility of the human mind. If you have a thing, or if you believe in things, then you must bring them within the pattern of universal integration. You must have an attitude of integrity toward things. The things will never really be true, factual, or real. But the sense of responsibility toward them becomes the basis of human character, as Confucius so clearly pointed out. Therefore, under our economic theory, we can delude ourselves, we can deceive ourselves, these are bad enough, but we can destroy ourselves about things that have no existence. And this is very bad and constitutes one of the problems that we face today. If, for example, we set a value upon something, we then, as it were, take upon ourselves the rules of a game. If we are going to play bridge, we must follow the rules of bridge. If we are going to play checkers, we follow the rules of checkers. And only those players who follow the rules uh, can compete with each other in terms of that particular game. In all rules, it is considered unethical to cheat. And this is also true in the rules governing things. Once these rules are accepted and generally applied, the conscious growth of the individual depends upon fair play. Thus, from his things, he experiences a series of opportunities, a series of temptations. He becomes aware of ways to exploit. He also becomes aware gradually that exploitation itself is not good. So from these things that have no life, meaning, or value in themselves, there descend chains of valuable experiences. And about things, we gain an understanding of the bondage of possession, which Buddha very clearly pointed out. No man possesses anything. Every man is possessed by his own possessions. Consequently, we want to make this load as light as possible. Also, we want to make certain that what we have does not destroy what we are. This is the eternal problem, the ever-present danger, that we are going to gradually mistake these things for value. The Chinese have the fable, of course, of the man in the desert who had been struggling on hour after hour to reach the oasis because he was dying of thirst. And finally he came to this place in the desert where an oasis had been, but there was no longer any water. Therefore his hope was shattered. But another traveler had been there before him and had died there. And this traveler had left behind great chests of gold and jewels. But the poor man who was in desperate need of water could do nothing with these. Therefore, he finally joined the previous owner. He also died beside the jewels which were useless to him and which he would gladly have exchanged for a few glasses of water. Thus, value has something to do with need. 
and values are all relative and comparative. Let us say, then, that a person living in our Western psychology has a certain sense of ownership. He desires to possess, and he naturally desires to possess those things which he regards as good. He naturally desires to have good quality and the best possible uh, materials in what he owns. But he now becomes more or less the servant of these. Buddha tells the story of the man who assembled a great fortune and then was unable to sleep for fear that he would lose it. So he sat all night guarding the money that he made in the daytime until he destroyed his health and died. He could not uh, allow these possessions to be out of his sight for fear someone else would steal them. So with ownership comes the inevitable correlative, loss. With everything that comes, something departs. And the more powerful our sense of possession is, the more easily we are hurt by loss. Possession may mean not only the ordinary objects which we possess, but may also include honor, distinction, and these relative terms for a superior or exalted state of, or condition of life. Thus the individual who has lived well when deprived of his means has great trouble in making an adjustment to a simpler way of life. He remembers with happiness only the wealthiest days of his life. All these situations challenge us with the problem of things. Things must be maintained. We know this when we own property or anything of that nature. Things must be kept in repair. We know this when we own devices, machines, or instruments. Things must be kept clean. We know this when we own a home. Everything that we have becomes, in a sense, a kind of master. And in order to preserve some degree of value, we must maintain. And maintain is nothing but the slowing down of the natural processes of decay. The longer we can prevent the object from falling apart, the longer it seems to have some value, ultimately trade-in value for most people. In this process of protecting the things that we have, we may take a series of attitudes which may be uh, quite factual and yet inconsistent in themselves. We may say of an object that we have, I know that it is not important, really. Therefore, if it wishes to fall apart or rust out, I'm going to let it. But this is inconsistent with possessing it in the first place. If this object was important enough in our consciousness for us to buy it, and perhaps sacrifice other things in order to have it, we then take upon ourselves a responsibility which can only be met in two ways. One is to maintain and preserve what we regard to be valuable and the other is to totally outgrow the standard of value by which we were captured in this dilemma. Now, most persons who outgrow things do not outgrow the desire for things. They merely outgrow or reject objects which have lost their newness. And because of our very nature, we desire to possess, but having possessed, lose interest and reach out for other things not yet possessed, so that we do not administer the things that we have wisely. In this we break rules, and in breaking rules we set up new patterns of illusion which we must fight with in various departments of life. Zen, therefore, takes the ground that value becomes a great disciplining force. Things become the basis of a game, 
which we must play fully aware of all the elements of the game. As long as we do not deceive ourselves, there is no great harm done. If we choose to waste time in one life, nursing things that have very little value, this is our privilege. Nature will provide us further time to catch up in due course. But if we do accept this situation of things, then we come under a whole group of laws which govern the ownership, the administering of things, uh, their coming and going, their replacements, the methods by which we secure them, the way in which we make the money to buy them with, and what use we are going to make of them. And we even go so far as to fall into the dilemma of how we can give them away without hurting someone else. We come into a whole philosophy the moment we accept the significance of things. In the West, our whole way of life is built upon this philosophy of things. In the East, this idea is regarded as rather childish. But we are presumed to have the right to be childish if we so desire. The main problem is that we must not be juvenile delinquents. If we enjoy childish pursuits, these also must be gently and wisely and lovingly followed with no intention to do damage to another person or to any basic standard of values. Here then is the summary of the point. Things which we desire to have, we purchase at what we regard as reasonable prices. These reasonable prices are based upon a code, a code which in principle all men know. In Western way of life, this code is called a profit system, by which the individuals engaged in any enterprise are entitled to a reasonable return upon labor, effort, and capital investment. This is because the way of life in which we live forces us to make a living in these ways or by these means. Otherwise, we are unable to pay our own bills. But because we have this system, we are responsible for the continuance of this system in a reasonable and normal way. Therefore, actually, there are rules as to the absorbing power of markets. There are universal laws governing the percentages and ratios involved in a normal, reasonable profit system. As long as these rules are kept, the profit system itself, which is a thing, gradually disintegrates over a period of 25, 50, or 100,000 years, or something of that kind, in a rather pleasant, non-disturbing manner. It grows old genteelly and will finally drop dead. But as still, we have it. But if we abuse this system, it becomes sick. And the moment it becomes sick, it becomes like a sick child or a sick relative, very much of a nuisance. Especially when we look back upon the situation and come to the conclusion that it is responsible for its own bad health and we are the victims thereof. Actually, when an economic system enters into a state of inflation, which we are beginning to learn too much about these days, our economic system is sick. Now, the only reason why it can be sick is because the people involved in the system are not honest. And therefore, they have not accepted the law governing the very institution that they have created. Now, when you believe in something, especially if it doesn't happen to really have any existence, 
this immediately involves you in the state of karma. Now, karma is a law that can operate only in an area of illusion. Karma cannot operate in the, war, in the world of reality. Karma is therefore always a problem of illusions which produce pleasant or unpleasant consequences which are themselves illusions. And these illusions in turn become the causes of further illusion. An illusion goes on and on until ultimately reality sets in. But this may take, and usually does take, a very long time. But wherever we have a material thing, we have this karmic cycle set up. This karma does not affect our souls. It does not affect our spiritual destiny, and it does not affect our consciousness. But it will affect mistakes which we make mentally, emotionally, or psychically. If we have the wrong attitude toward things, this karma turns on us and makes us utterly miserable. Why does it make us miserable? Because, as one of the Zen masters said, we must sit by and watch the gradual disintegration of something that isn't there. And this is bad enough. In fact, if it happens, we generally visit a psychologist. But... The fact of the matter is that these things which we most cherish and about which Western man has built his strongest attachments, these are things which are simply not there. But they appear to be there. They seem to be there. We open our eyes and look and there they are. But when we say they, they are there, what do we mean by they? We mean things. Now, there are countless things in this world that are there that mean absolutely nothing to us. Therefore, the fact that they exist does not make them important to us. There are some magnificent coconuts growing on some tree in the South Pacific. They are magnificent coconuts, but we're not even interested in them. We don't know they exist. If we find out enough about them, perhaps we go into the import and export business. But at the moment, we don't know about them. Therefore, these coconuts ripen and fall in due time, and we do not care. Yet they are as much realities as the fruit on the tree in our own backyard that we are trying to protect from the neighbors. <laughs> it isn't a thing. It's our relationship to it. Consequently, it is perfectly true that we can open our eyes and see the teapot. But it also is equally true that the teapot has no importance to us except our attitude toward it. If this attitude is variously distorted, this teapot can pass a whole group of karmic pressures on to us. Not because the teapot has them, but because we find in the teapot a catalyzing agent for our own possessiveness. And it thereby turns upon us as a persecuting force. To meet this situation, therefore, the moderate attitude of the wise person is the only protection from inordinate value or value that is not real. If we look into the window and we see the teapot, and we go into the store and we were foolish enough to say to the merchant, oh, I want that teapot so bad. How much is it? The price has doubled right then and there. As soon as the merchant knows that we want it, the price goes up. Thus, in our own desire to possess, we begin to enhance our own estimation of the value of the object, and very possibly the merchant. No matter how high he raises it, will still sell it to us. He is selling it to us on our own evaluation. We have told him in 
emotional pressure that we are willing to pay anything, and he charges us accordingly. Yet the teapot is still the same 50 cent teapot it started out to be. All of the rest of the value is our own emotion. The first karmic action, of course, is that we have to pay too much for it. Out of our hard-earned savings or whatever funds we have, we must now pay more than the teapot is worth because we have bestowed upon the teapot more emotion than it is entitled to receive. If we'd gone in very simply and said, I need a teapot, how much is that one? We probably would have bought it much more cheaply. Or if we merely wanted a teapot because we made tea, we could watch bargains and find one that would be perfectly useful. But the moment emotion comes in, false value is added. And this false value gradually builds up the concept of inflation. The whole and total concept of physical worth or physical value therefore gradually leads us along a way of physical excess until what we now know as extravagance sets in. And extravagance means that we spend more than we should because our own emotional intensities have gained control of our common sense. The more we spend in this way, the more we must earn. The more we demand of life, the more we must give to life in terms of our own honor. Therefore, if our demands and desires are beyond our reasonable means, we must use unreasonable means to secure what we want. This leads to all kinds of unfair and dishonest practices. And all these practices in which we destroy friendships, uh, defraud our neighbors, perhaps cheat our own families, and gradually come to a level of living and thinking in which subjectively we hate ourselves. All of this arises from the fact that we must have a teapot, and we want it so badly that we will pay ten times what it is worth for it. Having done this and shown it to someone else and told him what we paid for it, his desires become immediately exaggerated also, and he offers us twice what we paid for it. And so it goes on until someone drops the teapot, and then the entire bubble of value breaks. To meet this situation, there is only one answer to inflation, there is only one answer to runaway economies, and that is the individual gradually recognizing that things are only use values, that things are only valuable to a certain point, and that nothing is priceless which we can get along without. And man can get along without many things which he now regards as absolutely necessary. But this necessity is not based upon need. It is based upon mental and emotional exaggerations. It is the same, for example, in the problem of accumulating various kinds of specialized wealth. As far as practical purposes are concerned, diamonds are just about as valuable as pebbles. They are somewhat more scarce, but not as scarce as the jeweler would have you think. And if the available diamonds in the world today were flooded onto the market all at once, you could buy first grade stones for two dollars a carat. But by controlling the market, you never know how little a diamond is worth until you try to sell it. But the emotional and sentimental factor of the diamond has been given so much exaggerated publicity that it has become not only a symbol of the sacred circumstances of marriage and things of that nature, but it has also become an important status symbol. 
when really it is nothing but a reasonably pretty bit of carbon which has no actual value except this sentimental value. It is said that the Incas of Peru never caught up with the gold standard and preferred to use this metal, metal for roof tiles, which was probably quite good. They made, made very pretty tiles. Today we are worried to death as the supply of it, Fort Knox, begins to dwindle. We have created a great system of world exchange on the basis of metal. We keep on with this long enough and we must pay the karma of it. Not because uh, the relationship is in violation of some natural law. The karmic problem lies in the reaction of an illusion upon ourselves and our own insistence upon the perpetuation of that illusion. So if we are going to follow the classical or philosophical thinking on this subject, we realize that independence is not really the result of having more, but of needing less. And that the individual who wishes to have an interesting life and a full life, a life of value himself, must stop becoming the victim of the hypnosis of things. This doesn't mean he has to throw them away. It doesn't mean that he has to cast all of his goods upon the world and so they will all be hypnotized by them and go out to be a hermit somewhere. Nor is it necessary for us to follow the example of Diogenes, who suddenly deciding that uh, his water cup was a sordid luxury, threw it away and drank out of the hollow of his hand from that time on, declaring that there was no better vessel ever made. He was probably right, but it was a rather extreme attitude, and that is not what we necessarily uh, advocate. It is simply the power to move in a world of things, to use these things, but not to allow them to use us. To have what we need, but not allow ourselves to be exploited by the avarice of other persons, trying to lure us and tempt us into an unreasonable relationship with things. That we should quietly gain the capacity to accept or cast aside without these tremendous emotional pressures that we realize from the beginning that the things we have should be those things which simplify life, which give us necessary protection insofar as things can do this, that these things should be of a nature that will require the least allotment of those values which are above things. A, man, a man's time the hours that belong to his lifespan here are far more important than things. And the more of his hours he must devote to his things, the poorer he is. But the things he can see, therefore he considers them valuable. The hours he cannot see, and he has been wasting them for years anyway, therefore he does not regard them as valuable. So even while his things are in the process of gradual decline and disintegration, he uh, is more rapid than they are and therefore can leave them behind for someone else to inherit. But he has lost the complete pattern of value. And nations and systems that lose this pattern of value open themselves to war, open themselves to class and industrial struggle strikes, all kinds of difficulties, and where a great people comes under this common psychosis, we can have conquerors attempting to conquer other peoples simply in order to control the goods and products and things of these other people. By degrees, therefore, things become the object of every conceivable conspiracy.
And the defense of them becomes the basis of practically all of the defense strategies of man. In all this, something very important is completely overlooked. The person no longer has a life. His false values, therefore, bring back another karmic reaction on him. Because he believes that which is not true, he must spend his life defending that which is not true. And so he dies, surrounded by his goods which he cannot take, and empty in his own consciousness because he has had no time or inclination to cultivate that which he could take with him. This is all bad uh, interpretation of the principle of value. Orientals also, however, do give us a somewhat different series of patterns, pointing out that illusions are of many kinds and types. Some illusions educate us more than others. Some, some illusions seem to have more value than others. There are nice illusions and not nice illusions. And we are always happy when nice ones come along and we hold on to them desperately until they fall apart between our fingers. Illusions, therefore, can be divided into strata. There are illusions which have tremendous physical fascination. Illusions in which we measure everything in terms of their effect upon our material existence. Here are all the symbols of creature comfort that we know. Here are all the evidences of our prosperity. Here are the endless gadgets and devices for which Western man has become world famous. Then there are other things which we may desire to possess. And these are those things which satisfy our emotional lives. Our emotional lives may not be completely content with physical objects. Our emotional lives demand relationships. They demand friendships, affections, and regards. They want admiration, recognition, opportunities to satisfy certain emotions of pride, or emotions of desire. So we have a whole world of things which cater to our feelings. In this particular world we have, among other things, art, which is a tremendous emotional instrument, catering to certain psychic hunger within our own natures and perhaps as important to the psychic nature as food is to the body. Now, here's an interesting Zen parallel. When a man is hungry and wants food, he has two thoughts in mind, or one of two. Does he wish to eat that which will sustain the body, or does he wish to eat that which merely pleases the senses. Thus the Zen would recommend that for the person who wishes uh, to satisfy a natural hunger in a proper way, that the food be simple, but pleasantly served, interesting, and in the Oriental way of doing things with that tremendous emphasis upon textures and flavors and designs, one of the things that you find in oriental meals is simply the sheer beauty of the plate and its contents. It comes into you as a work of art, which is in itself a way of feeding you. Here things come in and uh, they are a little rec reminiscent of Picasso in most cases. As a work of art, the average meal is a complete dud or we might say an outstanding example of post-impressionism, neorealism, or the disillusionment which had its origin uh, at Montparnasse and Montmartre in uh, Paris. There is something reminiscent of modern art in a handful of wilted fried potatoes. <laughs> this would not happen in an oriental 
form of any kind of dignity. But food should be simple, natural, and healthy. Now, when your soul seeks art, it seeks either nourishment or simply uh, aggrandizement. The soul, which in its concept of art, wishes ostentation, is the same kind of a soul that produces the man who wishes extravagant meals which may make him sick. So as simple food nourishes the body, so simple beauty nourishes the soul. And great art is nearly always simple, with the same quiet, natural message that great food on a physical level would also convey. And then we go on further and we find our possessions, things in terms of mental satisfaction. The mind seeks also the fulfillment of its various purposes and to attain mental possession of things. Men fight with ideas, with knowledge, with skills, with arts, with crafts, and with trades. And here again, simplicity is the secret of honor. Moderation is the secret of strength. And honor is the secret of success. So gradually, out of the experience of ages, men come to the recognition of the simple life, the simplification of things, until that small group of things which we do possess have become truly meaningful, and they have become instruments of liberation. They are no longer possessed because we demand ownership. They are possessed as we should possess a friend, simply because it is a privilege to share certain things. And when the friend desires to go, we bid him Godspeed with as much peace as we welcomed him. I know cases where a great collector of Oriental art has uh, observed that some person was deeply moved, tremendously affected by a beautiful art object, and turned around and gave it to him. The owner was liberated. He enjoyed it. He could enjoy having it. He could enjoy not having it. He could also greatly enjoy the fact that he had given joy to someone else by passing it on to him. And all things, according to the Chinese connoisseur, must ultimately belong to the individual who most greatly appreciates them. Therefore, appreciation is another kind of coinage, a coinage above money, by which things which are deserved cannot ultimately be prevented uh, from coming in some form or in some way to those who deserve them. Very often we get what we deserve, what we want, what we desire, without ever possessing it, because reward does not have to be possessed. It can be experienced without ownership. And gradually the world settles into a different kind of a relationship with life. The individual is no longer afraid of what he has or for what he has. Because this power of these things to control him, this power has gradually been relinquished. In this procedure, of course, we have a form of discipline. This discipline, by the way, is good Zen. And Zen always starts where you are. Zen is not a procedure in which we uh, wait until we reach a very high degree of renunciation or something, and then suddenly jump into the ocean of the doctrine. This is not the point. Zen always begins where you are. And this also brings another interesting aspect of Zen into focus. It is not at all certain that the Zen experience is identical with any two human beings. We have always thought of reality as something in which everybody finally came to a magnificent agreement with everybody else. 
And we have been working toward that, not too industriously, but uh, moderately. We are always hoping, of course, that we will be the one with whom, in the end, all others will agree. <laughs> this, incidentally, is a false hope, and we hope you will recover from it as quickly as possible. But there is no proof that Zen is a standardized, a standardized experience. There is no proof that we will all ultimately discover it to be round or square or flat. There is nothing that indicates that the path of Zen is into a path of conformity with other people. Actually, Zen is an experience by means of which we come into a new relationship with ourselves. And by the time we reach the higher degrees of Zen, which lead to the doctrine of the void or the ultimate emptiness of illusion, there is no actual evidence that we will ever actually come to a state where we will consciously shake hands with everyone else and say the world is now of one mind. Uh, it is unlikely that this will happen. Zen doesn't feel that this is the basis of the brotherhood of man. Zen says that the brotherhood of man is based upon each individual respecting the experience of others that there is no need to agree. The only need is that there shall be earnest endeavor, and that this earnestness is the ground of kinship, not agreement as to the final attainments or the final opinions or conclusions. This is why Zen refuses to dogmatize any subject. But in our search for value, or the uh, value of things, there is no way in which we can indicate that anything has a fixed value, nor will be of equal value to any two persons in this world. Nor is there any way in which we can say that a certain object, fetish-like or like a talisman, can produce some extraordinary magical benefit upon anyone who comes in contact with it. These various magical devices seemingly produce certain effects upon some people and no effect upon other people. Actually, therefore, the price or the value of a thing can never be determined. A thing has no value except the values placed upon it by the innumerable owners, possessors, or desirers of these things. And uh, these persons have their value as an experience of their own consciousness. And there is no evidence that any two persons are in agreement on this. The only way what appears to be agreement can be attained is by some pricing system by which all persons are required to pay the same amount for a thing. It being assumed, therefore, that if they do this, they all value it equally. And this is also untrue, because the persons buying these things all value that with which they buy them differently. And one man will say, my goodness, this costs a hundred dollars. My, that's a lot. And another person will say, what? Only a hundred dollars? It's cheap. This is how we value the hundred dollars, not how we value the object. We have come constantly to the wrong uh, focal point in terms of value. We think of the thing when we should be trying to understand the motive in ourselves by which these things seem to take on meaning. Now, as we go along refining our interests in life, as through the discipline of our own consciousness, we turn from the more obvious interests to those of greater meaning, greater ethical, moral, or psychic value. This refinement procedure affects our concept of what is valuable around us. Also, it affects our concept of 
how and what we should do on certain levels of function. For example, we recently read of the painting in New York that was of Rembrandt that was sold for over two million dollars. This uh, was an enormous price, one of the largest prices ever paid for a picture. Well, why was it so valuable? Probably the value of it belongs to an experience of folk consciousness. Actually, as the Chinese point out, in the course of time, that which is essentially good gradually comes to the surface. That which is not good gradually sinks into oblivion. There is no question as to the artistic skill of Rembrandt van Rijn. He was a very great artist. But there is an absurdity about estimating his picture in the terms of two million dollars. This two million dollars represents, therefore, uh, a certain applause, a certain tribute paid to the artist. But as the Zen would point out, if this picture is worth two million dollars, it is priceless. It has no money value at all. Because if it has money value, it will gradually go up until no one can buy it. Then the picture is uh, are no longer of value to anyone. The money value is only a tribute paid to it in an era of inflated economic consciousness. The picture is either good or bad. The picture is either worthless or valuable. There is every reason to assume that this picture is valuable. Valuable because of the quality of the work. Valuable because it strikes into our own subconscious and we are glad to see the picture. Our own psychic life, therefore, is moved into recognition of the merit of the subject. And this merit causes us to recognize value. But we might see equally merit in a small clay bowl that was dug out of a mound in Korea, which maybe 1,500 years ago was used by a farmer to warm his tea. Bowls of that type and kind today, if they appear on the market, also bring fantastic prices. Not as much as a Rembrandt, because we do not know them as well, or not because, uh, or because we are, they are not so obviously dramatic. But it is not uncommon for a bowl that probably cost a hundredth of a cent when it was made, made in Korea during one of the better periods, to sell today for twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars, because of a value which we have come to recognize, and also because of scarcity and many other factors. It is gradually notable, however, that as individuals do move along the path of enlightenment, they become more and more concerned with intangible values, what it can contribute to the unfoldment of the consciousness of the person who is its temporary owner. As we become more discriminating and more selective, therefore, more interested in fulfilling the internal need of life, rather than its material situations, we begin to develop more refined instincts in art and music and literature and all kinds of important things of this kind. In this way also, we begin to release the world and ourselves from very much of the competition and pressure of things. The person who is interested only in value, true value, is not a heavy competitor in the ordinary affairs of life. He is not going to war for his possessions and things of that nature. He is naturally a peace-loving, law-abiding, uh, thoughtful citizen. Consequently, his karma moves in these directions. How is it, then, that in the idea of Buddhism or in Zen, that we do not have the complete rejection of all things 
In a sense, Buddha does give us this complete rejection, but his faith never accepted it. It never accepted the loss of beauty as a factor in religion. It never lost the fine painting or the magnificent carving. And gradually these were brought to adorn the very temples themselves. The same was true of Christian art. But while Christianity began as a very simple faith, there can be no doubt that men have heaped upon the shrines of their faiths, their richest and noblest possessions, given great, generously and often with great contrition of spirit as an indication that inner consolation is more important than worldly goods. This type of thing we have always noted. Zen does not condemn beauty, but it does try to make it as simple as possible. Zen also tells us something else about things, namely that we become beggared uh, to the skills and abilities of other people. Today, most of everything that we have, we buy in some degree of completeness. Little by little, we lose practically all creativity in ourselves. We are a great age of buyers, not an age of creators. And we do recognize and applaud those geniuses who produce some extraordinary or unusual uh, work of art, and we probably will fairly generously support them. But the average person is not creative. 25, 35 years ago, it was customary for practically all families to at least have some music in their homes. Music probably mostly meant the piano, or singing, or a mandolin, or a guitar. But these younger people, and often with their parents and friends and neighbors, created music. Maybe not as good as the high fidelity of today, but at least creative. They were doing it themselves. And in a, as a mystical experience in man, uh, actually, to be able to pick out silver threads among the gold on the piano with one finger gives more creativity than a great symphony that you simply listen to and do nothing about yourself. There is no participation. And while appreciation is a great value, participation is of great necessity also. We have ceased to be creative. Zen would like to bring this back. It would like to do it through the encouragement of the whole concept of folk art and folk lore. It would like every person to be able to do something himself. Where the Zen people came from, Japan and China, they had one advantage that we do not have. Their families and their training had much to do with skill in writing. In Japan and China, writing is an art, and the written forms are considered as beautiful as pictorial design. When you write a beautiful poem, and you are a fine, uh, have a fine example of writing, you are a good man with the brush. If you have this, you have produced a work of art in which your thoughts have been expressed through a very skillful use of your writing materials. Thus, most of your Orientals are halfway on the road to be painters by the time they are ten years old. Because they have learned so marvelously to handle their brushes, uh, they can turn almost immediately to various forms of artistic composition. And it is not at all uncommon in a Japanese family for the guests uh, to uh, produce or make art work as a symbol of their friendship among themselves. Here in this country we have guest books. And when you have a party, your friends all sign the guest book. In Japan you have little cards with gold edges that are supplied for this purpose. And on these cards, you write a poem, or you draw a picture, or both. Or you do something out of your own creativity, and you leave it 
with your host as a present. He is greatly honored. Everybody is profoundly pleased with the whole proceeding. And it is astonishing to see what you get. Uh, I know I have seen a number of collections of these things that have been in Japanese families. Here is a magnificent painting of storms, rocks, and sea. A beautiful work, as fine as anything you could find anywhere. It was not done by a professional artist. It was done by an honored guest who was a politician. Beautiful work of art. The next one was a wonderful painting of a small child, marvelously executed with the greatest detail. This one was done by a doctor who visited the family. So what do you have? You have engineers that are ivory carvers. You have doctors that are painters. You have politicians that are musicians. You have tradesmen who do most marvelous and delicate things. You will even find a magnificent poem, marvelously done, beautifully written, by the family masseur or something of that nature. The gardener, who has already learned to work marvels with plants, is also able to make a beautiful drawing of a branch of cherry blossoms and a little bird. The man who you would call here the delivery man for some grocer store will leave you a beautiful little memento on the holiday season, a drawing which would be worthy of a great artist. He did it himself. Now this helps something. It means a tremendous amount in value. It means that these people have never lost the ability to create in themselves some expression to move consciousness out into action. When a great family in Japan ceases or passes out of existence and their possessions may be distributed in one way or another, collections of these gift cards or these equivalent to uh, testimonials and mementos of various affairs Sometimes collections of great numbers of these drawings and poems and various little mementos have gone on to the market or gone on to auction. Some time ago, a collection of these pictures done entirely by amateurs and cherished in a family for many years, several generations, was sold in Tokyo at a price that would be equivalent of about $75,000 American money and was well worth it. And not one of them was by a professional. They were all by friends, by neighbors, by people who expressed and expressed beautifully. Now this is something that, how much is it, and where can I buy it, kills. This is something that causes us to go to the store and buy a present for our friend. So that when we visit him, we give it to him. But we have given something we have bought, not something we have created. He, in turn, is overjoyed because he knows that if we created anything, he'd have to throw it away. He knows that we have no skill anyway. He also would be embarrassed because it might mean that he would ex we would expect him to create something, and he can't do it either. Or everybody gets together and gets a hobby shop and makes all kinds of bookends until every book in the neighborhood has two pair of ends. <laughs> This is the imagination. It dies. We can, perhaps, with fifteen to twenty thousand dollars worth of equipment, make a fairly decent card table. But with a ten cent brush and a block of ink, these people do works of art, great things, simply because the consciousness is there, and the simplicity of method and the simplicity of media only more clearly reveals the creativity of the individual. So we have another element here of the problem of things. The importance of experiencing the creation of things. This, this creation of things is never to be regarded primarily as economic. None of these beautiful paintings were ever prepared to be sold to anybody. They were made simply from affection, regard, and esteem 
They were spontaneous expressions of uh, gratitude or appreciation, and they, they were not intended to be displayed to other people. It was just the person expressing himself because it gave him pleasure to do so. This type of thing is disappearing too much from our Western way of life. And in disappearing, we have lost most of our overtones. And when our overtones perish, our world perishes, as far as we are concerned. We cannot survive without them. So we must also, if we take things out of the world, we must give things to the world. Now these things are illusions, just like the things we take. But these illusions tell something that is not quite an illusion. They tell us something that brings us again into the Zen idea. Assuming that a Zen of high development was able to sit quietly on the side of a mountain and contemplate the entire unfoldment of the world, he would be in the presence of the grand illusion. He would be in the presence of things which seemingly exist. But he would be in the presence of endless change and eternal decay. And even while he blinked his eyes once, millions of living things perished. He would be, therefore, in the presence of a transitory existence. But if he was thus sitting quietly, contemplating these larger things, a pattern of symbolism would be created within his own consciousness. He would gradually learn from this illusion something of the nature of the reality behind it. He would use the grand, the grand illusion as a stepping stone to the unveiling of itself, as a means of gradually coming closer and closer to the mystery which is behind the illusion. Gradually, through his contemplation, this monk would become aware of the passing glory of worldly things. He would see value. He would see it rise and fall. He would see nations come and go. He would see inventions that make fortunes and then are discarded. He would see the heroes of today become the villains of tomorrow. The great actors who are forgotten. Uh, the great uh, politicians who sink back into obscurity again. He would see all kinds of phenomena. And he would realize that all of this phenomena is suspended from what? And you the come to the basis of the Zen concept of the Huiyan doctrine, namely that all of these things are suspended from the void. The only thing that is real is this unknown, this thing which has neither beginning nor end, neither cause nor effect, but is the mysterious eternity into which all things are apparently retiring and declining again. Phenomena disintegrates into space, into eternity, into vacuum, into the void, into the depthness of things. And out of it gradually, uh, the Zen monk would come to the conclusion or come to the realization that all this phenomena with its interplay and infinite relationship has one lesson to teach, one valid and authentic report to make, and that is the gradual revelation of the meaninglessness of itself. Therefore, all illusion is here for man to experience. For man's power to experience is limited to the experience of illusion. Man cannot experience reality. He cannot experience the void. He can experience anything else. But reality is beyond his comprehension, beyond his power to experience. Therefore, he must approach it by experiencing that which is not it. Now, it's the same way in a more humble manner with a problem of things. We discover what are the more valuable things, usually by discovering first those things which are not valuable. Why is this so? Simply because we can only determine value by experience. 
and we can only uh, come to experience through the discovery of non-value. Judgment arises as the result of experience. It cannot anticipate it. A man cannot therefore be right before he has experienced. In this way, the correct judgment is always the last experience of the thing. Because upon this and upon this final experience alone, all previous experience converges. It is not possible, therefore, to be right in the first place and prove it later. You have to have the living proof growing and moving within yourself. Otherwise, you cannot know rightness. You cannot know which is value. So you have to outgrow the things which gradually prove that they do not help. A person placing great faith or trust in another individual is deceived. And in this experience we are deceived many times. For every person has trusted the wrong individuals time and time again. But gradually out of this disappointment, this disillusionment, in which we always blame the other person, but actually the blame lies in our own inability to sense value. But we pass through bitterness, we pass through antagonism, we turn against society, we hate everybody. We become afraid, almost, of our fellow man. We doubt his every thought and move, and we go on negatively in this way, continually hurt and continually hurting, and constantly afraid. Finally, this house of cards falls apart altogether. We ultimately realize that we cannot live with fear, that we cannot continue to hate without being sick and miserable. And no matter what anyone ever does to us, it cannot be as bad as what we are doing to ourselves by continuing this negative pattern. So sometime, somewhere, we wake up. And the moment we wake up, we wake up into a value. We have outgrown something. We have come, therefore, to a new standard of what is important. And that which is important, value, is ultimately that which is of value. We do the same thing with our own personal appetites, our emotions our ambitions. We pass through these circles and cycles in which we turn calmer upon ourselves by the false efforts uh, to press value where it does not exist. Ultimately we relax and the Zen monk takes the attitude that if we can relax completely, relax into the existent rather than into the existing that suddenly we live in a universe in which we do not really need to own anything. We have things, we use them, we earn them if necessary, we are not going to become dependent upon other people. But ownership, possession, and the vast area of so-called status elements simply disappear. The individual becomes too concerned over the realities of life to permit himself to remain hypnotized by things of no importance. This is an experience. He is growing. So value has in material things uh, the power to gradually disillusion us about these very things. And then we come to other material possessions which seemingly are more important. We come to the little Korean bowl, which is not in any way associated with the pressure and stress of our ordinary accumulation, but perhaps in the terms of material things could cost a pretty penny, particularly now. What is our attitude toward this? We can say to ourselves, we can sell it. Maybe we can have several hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars and buy an automobile. But then the other individual who has it says to himself, where is my value? Is my value in this automobile or is my value in this bowl? What is important to me as consciousness? 
Uh, what is the value of this thing in comparison to some other thing? And he may say, this thing gives me peace of mind. This gives me relaxation. I feel better. I'm happier. I feel a warm, intimate kindliness come over me when I look at this little bowl. Put me behind the wheel of an automobile and I may become a relentless destroyer of men. I will work out all kinds of complexes and frustrations on society. Or perhaps I will make a lot of trips to places where I had no real intention of going. And as the Chinese observed, when they gave him an ox cart, he was traveling so fast he no longer could see anything anyway. There is no way of traversing, as the Taoist monk says, uh, the path of life that is as dramatic as to go on foot. Because when you go on foot, you go slowly. Every beautiful scene, as you turn a little corner, you can pause and consider. You live in a world that is larger because you are traveling more slowly. After a while, you travel very fast. The world feels very small, appears to get smaller every day, and one morning you wake up with the delusion that you can conquer it. Men who walk seldom attempt that because they see the infinite diversity of life as they proceed. So again, what are the important things? One great Oriental artist said the most important thing he had ever seen was a little flower growing out from under the edge of a stone. In that moment he received a Zen enlightenment. The sensitivity of this situation suddenly produced the strange result that is called Satori. It was the sudden sensing of kinship with life. And there is nothing in the world in the form of pots and pans and all kinds of gadgets that could possibly bestow this. Because here was something that had its primary ingredient, namely that it was natural, that it was eternal, that no one had to own it, that no one cared. But in this thing was something no one could own, something utterly beyond all ordinary value. There is another thing that's interesting about this type of thought. What would have happened if two men, one Asiatic and the other a Westerner, had both seen that little flower growing under the edge of the rock? Now, what would have happened? Supposing they were both good men, the Easterner simply stood very quietly and looked at it and allowed the meaning of it to possess him. The Westerner also looked at it. He was profoundly moved. He was deeply touched. It was such a precious thing that he had to pick it and put it in between two sheets of paper and save it forever. So out of sheer affection, he killed it on the spot, which is our typical way of doing things. He couldn't leave it alone. The Eastern man did not need to pick it because it was always in his heart from that moment on. He could recall it at any instant and maybe twenty years later, with a brush on a piece of silk, he could have drawn it again, with all its perfection, for he would have accepted it into himself and then allowed it to move out of himself again onto a piece of silk. It would have been somewhat strangely changed, more symbolical, perhaps even simplified from the little mystery of itself. But to the Easterner, life was there, not to destroy, but to admire. Not to take, but to leave. Not to interfere with, but to bless. Whereas in the West, what we want, we must take. What we desire, we must have. And we sort of have a feeling that all things exist in order that we can pick them. We mean well, but we have trouble with this flower in the crated wall. We have trouble with it. We have the tremendous desire to possess it. This is, the, uh, this is the essential difference between the person who can enjoy the thing, who lives in a world of things that are all his, because he has never claimed any of them. An individual who, because he has never claimed them, can never lose them. And they all fit together to form the Satori experience. They give to this individual something of the mystery and the grandeur of space itself. So when we go into 
value in terms of things. Everything that is alive has its own value. It is itself. Everything that is not alive, in the sense of still a growing organism, things like little pots and vessels and fabrics and things like that, in which there is no longer the inherent vitality of continuous growth. Uh, where this is absent, then a new value has come in, a kind of life which is now a combination of the materials and the genius which fashioned them into something. So that in each of his little vessels, the soul of the potter still lives. In each of his fabrics, the master weaver has a certain continuance. And there is a different kind of aliveness. The aliveness of creativity. The aliveness of noble example. One of the things that we can gain from great art, or the wonderful crafts of the world, is a revival, a refreshment of our faith in men. Today it looks so easy to say that there are not many good people left in this world. And we look back over history and we read of war and plague and pestilence. We say there probably never were many good people in this world. This world has been a pretty selfish place. And then we find the little bowl. We do not know who made it, but the person who made that had to have been a great person, had to have been a beautiful person, had to have had in themselves this tremendous power of understanding. Now, it may not have been a cultured understanding. It may not have been an understanding that resulted from many years' study of potteries and ceramics. It wasn't. It was simply the understanding of the individual who needed a bowl for his tea. It had no thought of being an artist whatsoever. But he had to live with his bowl. He could only make it the way he felt it. it took him probably all of two or three minutes to spin it out on a wheel. But he had to do it himself. And it had to be something that he could say, I will drink my tea from this because I like it. So in a strange way, in this simple way, this, uh, this craftsman, this simple farmer perhaps, has created or revealed the great artistry of the human soul. He has caused to come out of himself something of exquisite beauty, something that the ages will admire. Now all over the world things of this kind have been done. They've come from simple people. They've come from the rich and the poor. They've come from every level of society. And everywhere they tell that inside of man there is a yearning for that which is good. A determination to express some inner conviction. There is an honor, an honesty, and an integrity tremendously found in folk art. Whether it be African or Asian or American Indian, or uh, wherever it comes from. It is simply honest love of good things. Too poor to buy them, but not too poor to make them. These people probably consciously would love to have bought a bowl and paid a great deal for it and have been able to drink their tea out of a cup that was as fine as that of some mandarin. But they couldn't. Because they couldn't, uh, they did not buy. They became great by creating. And there is no greatness in buying. There may be selectivity, but there is not the greatness of creation. So in these things, we get a realization that inside of man, there is a universal value. It is his own value. We don't say that this universal value comes from one source and that sometime all bowls will look alike. That there will someday be a perfect bowl. Actually, that someday is this moment. This moment there is a perfect bowl. These great things have already achieved perfection in an instant. And having achieved perfection, they have fulfilled themselves. And while they are great and wonderful things, and we admire them, 
The great person is not even going to worry about them, other than to be kind and guard them gently, because he knows that someday that bowl will be broken. It may take a hundred years, it may take a thousand years, but ultimately all of these beautiful things will disappear. Others may take their place, or perhaps we will lose this sense of value entirely and drift into a lower level of function, which I hope does not occur. But actually, the value of these things is first in our appreciation. But actually, more than that, the great value was in the revelation of the soul of the Creator. Each human being performing his own satori, performing his own revelation of the great meditation of life. It is only when we somewhat simplify that this is possible. And I think that we would have much more of this creativity if we did not so falsely associate value with things that are expensive and that we buy. We have become a world of buyers instead of a world of people who are expressing creativity. And in the West, of course, even our artists, with a very few exceptions, have been unappreciated. Uh, it has taken centuries to discover them, simply because we are too busy in this endless pursuit of the accumulation of things. And our present state is a monument to this, the natural karma of it. And unless we learn this lesson and break through the pattern, we will go on creating this situation for centuries yet to come. So we can now summarize a little bit our problem of things, and things as term of value. Things are valuable, perhaps, as mirrors which we can hold before our own faces. Whatever we like, whatever we say we want so badly that we have to go out and buy it, perhaps as a luxury that we, we just feel we need, what does it mean? Are we buying something that is really fine? Are we telling a story about the desire to release soul power or are we merely telling of an ambition to accumulate? There's a great deal of difference between a collector and an accumulator in art. An accumulator may have a wealth of possessions and have very little appreciation. An accumulator may hire agents to do most of his buying for him. An accumulator may elect a custodian or a curator of his collection who will make all of the necessary the markings and records, and will do all the research on these things with the result that the custodian becomes a very well informed man and probably develops a great deal of culture, whereas the owner has nothing, because uh, no man can chew another man's food for him. So the uh, actual problem of what you choose, what you sacrifice, how you decide these things, should give you a little insight into your own place in the evolution of your own consciousness. If you find uh, an instinct, a definite instinct towards status, if it becomes subtly, terribly important, you will have just a little more of the same than your neighbor. If there is a sudden feeling that, after all, you have to keep up with the mode, whatever it may be, that you just simply can't afford to live in a house that is different from the prevailing style, then you are simply telling yourself and everyone else that you do not have the courage or the insight to be moved or to be ruled from within yourself. If, however, you have the courage to be moved and self-ruled, this presents another slight difficulty. Supposing you decide to be original about all these things, you're going to live your way. The result must not be merely eccentricity. That does no good. I know people who have done it their way, and it is an abomination to themselves and everyone else. It's not just enough to be emancipated or liberated 
or to say, I don't care what other people think, I'll do it my way. You do that, naturally. But when you have the result, what have you got? And if the result is no good, it is no better because it is your result than it would be if it was anyone else's. So if in the effort to be original, you find that you only achieve a monumental bad taste, then you have to go to work on that. You have to realize that to be original, you must be created. You have to have the internal insight so that originality is always within law, that it is always the application of proper principles. You can be in original in color just as much as you want to, but you can never break the harmonic patterns of color without creating discord. You can compose anything you want to on the piano, but you must keep the rules of harmonics and melody or you're in trouble. So when you decide that you are not going to be one of the herd, and are going to do your own deciding and determine your own values, then you have to be sure that you can do so. That this liberty is not merely license. To attain this end, of course, we have the problem of the gradual refinement and uh, development of taste factors. And the person who tries to be eccentric too soon is only a rebel. He is not outgrowing the situation which he is trying to leave behind. He is in defiance. He is not in uh, recognition of value. So you have to have the power and the skill to do these things better. And this means that you have to gradually develop a better level or standard of value. The things that you choose must be chosen because of their own betterness. I've seen a number of examples of this type of thing working in, in particular the western part of our own country. There are some very beautiful homes in this area. Uh, when I mean this area, I mean Southern California. Many of these homes, I would say the majority of them, are not expensive homes. There are many very expensive homes, but they are not usually the best ones. Many of them represent no more in an investment that the average person has put in a tract house. But they, ha they have indicated that the individual himself the family had discovered something of Satori. There was something good about these houses. There was something that showed a great simplicity, a wonderful natural dignity. And it was economical also because it is much easier not to have bad things than it is sometimes to afford good ones. Therefore, quietude, simplicity, and directness mark a number of fine homes. And they also show the dawning appreciation of good art, good value, perhaps only in a simple object, but no longer the great cluttering, no longer the mass of things. Also, I remember visiting a very interesting apartment in New York City many years ago. It was one of these old brown stone fronts. And from the outside, it looked as though it belonged to a decadent period of the gay 90s in New York life. But when you went inside, you moved from this very obvious exterior into an inner world that told the story of the owner completely. A world of beauty, of great taste, a world of wonderful things accumulated over a lifetime, but with great discrimination. And this same person and not only had these wonderful things, but was completely free of the sense of ownership. They were not important or beautiful or valuable because they were his. He simply lived among them with the full experience of the fact that one of these days they would pass to someone else. He had no definite desire to hold on to them. But he said, as they move by as beautiful pictures, I can look at each one and be refreshed by it. And this type of thing does come into the lives of people. Now, I've noticed also that students of religion and philosophy and uh, metaphysical and mystical matters have neglected this phase of their lives for the most part. They have sort of felt that life was a problem of study, that they had to meditate their way to nirvana as quickly as possible, or that they had to in some way leave all this world behind long before they had outgrown it. Now, this is a mistake. You don't leave anything behind wistfully, sorrowfully, 
longingly, actually we move through philosophy through a continuing experience of values. Our philosophers in education and our scientists would be much better people if they loved art, if they loved the gentle things of life more sincerely, if they developed great taste in these things, a great discrimination, and then you could see shining through their lives these few fine simple evidences that their inner consciousness was working. If this could happen, we would have a much better civilization than we know now. And in the processes of meditation and mystical growth, if people were able to prove their growth by their discrimination, if they could prove that they are better people simply because everything they do is done with a better understanding of value, uh, we would find that uh, the very, ex very demonstration of value would in turn move in upon these people and help them to grow more rapidly. All things being equal, if you are a custodian of your environment. You are a custodian of everything that you have. It is either helping you or hurting you. You are either using it or abusing it. And through gradually clarifying the life around us, we reveal the integration of the life within us. This is all very important. It's something that's hard to talk about. But it's something that, once it is experienced, becomes tremendously meaningful. Esotericists in general, advanced psychological students, uh, students of comparative religion and the great philosophies of the world, should all of them be thoroughly aware of the great values of art, music, and literature. They should have these values so clear that the, uh, that the discipline of simplicity is moving in upon their conduct. All cluttering, all confusion, all conflict over things should be gradually but inevitably fading out. And in its place should be clear, simple decisions. The recognition of value, the importance of certain things, uh, the perfect willingness to sacrifice other things for those which are most needed at the moment as expressions of consciousness. So that someday the individual may say to himself, I'm not going to buy that new car this year, I'm going to buy that little Korean bowl. I will keep on driving the old car, but I will be very happy because I'm living with beauty. This decision comes as a little wrench uh, at a certain time. But when it is right, you just can't buy the car. You just have to buy the bowl. That's all there is to it. There's no longer any conflict. But this tells something about you when it happens. It tells something about the fact that your own inner life is moving out. And eternal value is coming to be more important. Now, it is true that the little bowl has not an eternal value. It is true that, as we say, it will be broken and discarded sometime. But the little bowl has peculiarly captured an eternal rhythm. For some reason, which we will never perhaps be able to fully define, the man who made it happened, because of his own consciousness, to make it right. He did something by means of which hundreds of other persons who have seen and owned this bowl since then have all known that it was great. They have sensed it because they have lived with it. It has moved them. There's something about this little bowl uh, that reaches into the life of us and rejoices the soul. So when the time comes, we probably will find more rejoicing in this than we will in one of the products of the Detroit tin factories. And we will say to ourselves, I would rather walk and live with that bowl. Now it's very probably we won't have to walk, but we'll have to sacrifice something. But it is not sacrifice anymore, because we are using what we have to fulfill the need of our own consciousness. And when we see something that makes us feel a little more of reality, which makes us more gracious, more understanding, more tolerant and more patient of all other things, 
when something comes that is medicine to consciousness, makes us a little happier, a little wiser, a little better, then instinctively that is the thing that we most need. That is the thing that is valuable. And for that we are willing to pay the price. But we are not willing to pay the price merely to maintain some kind of a competitive relationship with other people. So out of all of this comes a philosophy of art and a philosophy of value that I think has meaning. And perhaps if you are able to sort of experience between the lines, you will see what I am trying to say. It is very abstract. But it is like Zen. It's something you can't put into words. But once you've experienced it, it is always yours. And once you know what it means, you can never lose that knowledge. And once you build your values upon that, you will always know what is important, what is valuable. And you will always know what price a thing is worth. Whether it is worth the sacrifice, whether it is worth the love, or whether it is not. And little by little, you will become more discriminating and your friends and neighbors and everyone else will realize that a, an important change is occurring in you. A change that not only makes you like little bowls, but a change which makes you closer to truth, closer to the universe, closer to consciousness, nearer to the mysterious power of God, which is forever creating little bowls and embodying in them the great majesty of universal law. All, all this sort of moves through us and here is the story of the value of things and why things can be uh, helpful even though they are perishable and belong to the world of values that must sometime fade away well I guess our time is up so thank you very much for this attention while we meandered through this rather interesting but perhaps somewhat abstract subject thank you very much